I'm Stephen Foskett. I'm Frederick Van Heren. And this is the Utilizing AI podcast. Welcome to an episode of Utilizing AI, the podcast about enterprise applications for machine learning, deep learning, data science, and other topics. Today, we're talking a little bit more about shadow AI. This is one of those topics that's come up quite a lot, uh, both here on the podcast and the AI community in general, because just about the nature of it, it seems like there's a lot of AI being brought into companies uh, by different groups than traditional IT applications. Uh, is that what you're seeing as well, Frederick? Yeah, indeed. I mean, shadow, shadow AI is kind of an evolution of uh, shadow IT. It's, it's typically somebody with a bright ID, they want to apply so AI on it, they throw some hardware at it, and eventually they have, let's call it a prototype for the sake of the name of it. And, and in the end, um, it, is, it is kind of a, an isolated event. And so from an organization standpoint, where your goal is to bring a product to market, there is a lack of efficiency of the hardware, the software stack and the hardware stack are not really defined. And so there is really a need to pull that all together and to use some kind of an orchestrator to help you go from shadow IT, shadow AI, I should say, to a production environment. But that, that's an appropriate slip there because of course shadow IT has been with us forever. Uh, I think that if you're a student of computer history, you could, uh, reflect on the success of x86 as uh, being a result of shadow IT. People bought IBM PCs, uh, they bought Magic Pencil as their spreadsheet, they put it on their desk, and then later corporate IT had to figure out how to deal with this. And, and so we've been dealing with this for a long, long time. So that's why we decided to uh, invite on the podcast today uh, two folks from Run AI. So uh, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, Ronan, why don't you go first? Yeah, so hello, everyone. Um, great to be here, Stefan and Frederick. So thank you so much for inviting me. So I'm Ronen, uh, Ronen Da. I'm the CTO of, uh, of Run AI, uh, one of the co-founders. Uh, we started Run AI um, about three years ago, um, and I'm happy to be here. My name is Gijs uh, Janssen van Doorn. I'm really happy to be here as well. I'm uh, responsible for the technical product marketing at Run AI. I, I recently joined. I joined in uh, September. Before that, I spent some time in, in multiple other startups in the uh, infrastructure area. And it's, uh, it's great to now hop on a journey that's more related to, uh, to AI and its, its infrastructure challenges. Well, I think that, uh, Heis, that's actually a good uh, way to introduce this topic because both you and I came from this world of enterprise uh, IT operations and IT infrastructure. And we saw this happen again and again and again, where you had shadow IT. Somebody said, I need a solution. I found my solution. I'm not going to wait for IT to deploy this thing. I'm not going to wait for them to come up to speed or approve it or whatever. I'm just going to buy it. I'm going to make it happen. And since I'm the business, since I'm where the money comes from, then that's going to have to be okay. And it's not um, like a, a negative attitude. Honestly, it's a positive attitude. It's an innovative attitude, but it does cause some problems, right? I absolutely agree. We've seen it basically since IT started, it, uh, all the way from cloud where engineers and developers were just pulling their credit card and, and launching cloud resources to uh, Dropbox is a great example as well. Everybody had a, a Dropbox account, private Dropbox account somewhere to share files and then all of a sudden putting IT in this position of, okay, we need to control this. We need to centralize this. We need to make sure it's secure. We need to make sure it's efficient. Um, and I think as with any technology, like I mentioned, um, sharing of files, cloud, I think AI is now in a, in a similar uh, phase where people are buying resources because they need them. And then they sit somewhere without the control of IT, making sure it's efficient hence shadow AI. Right, so what do you see as being the biggest challenge to help a customer that is heavily involved in shadow AI and wants to go to production? So what are the biggest challenges you see there? Yeah, so I think, yeah, it's, it's a good question. So in shadow AI, you know, do you have data science teams or AI teams just buying hardware, buying computer resources to, to run their workloads, to train models and do what they 
what they need to do, right? And and of course, it's it's like they get what they need at the same moment, but they have this cut scattered infrastructure which is not really efficient and not really scalable, and 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 that's the place where IT can come, you know, and centralize the infrastructure and provide a, a pool a pool of uh, of resources that can be shared and can be can be scalable, a scalable solution for the data scientists uh, teams, for the AI teams. And I think in terms of challenges, we see two things, right? Two, 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 two main problems. First, we see that, you know, we see organizations just starting to centralize their infrastructure, right? They, they, they decide that AI is important in the organization. They see it grow and then you, they want to scale it and they've First thing they want to centralize the infrastructure, and they, and the IT wants to take control uh, for to do good things for the data scientists with it. And then you're getting problems of you know of starting like there are, there is not a lot of best practices today on how to establish an AI infrastructure on which hardware should I buy, which storage should I buy, what should be the software stack, what's important and what's not important. So we see time after time organizations just struggling with understanding like what what is the solution, what is the right solution, what how a good AI infrastructure sh should look like. So we see that. For, uh, for sure. We also see organizations that already built their AI infrastructure, right? Started to build it and, and they have already a centralized AI infrastructure. And then we see challenges around, around utilization and challenges around getting uh, for the data scientists the AI teams providing them what they need in terms of infrastructure, in terms of computer resources, in terms of the services they need to do what they need, what they do, what they do best. And what we see also very, very often is that data scientists are using a centralized infrastructure, but they need more. They need more computing power. They're asking for more GPUs, for example, for more resources for to do their job. And, and they feel like they are limited by the infrastructure in many times. And so that's from, from, one, from one side. And then from the other side, the IT looks at the, the infrastructure and the utilization is so low, right? So we, time after time, we see 10% of 10 utilization, 20% utilization, right? The infrastructure, GPUs are just sitting idle, uh, for example. And then while data scientists are needing more compute, Right, so we see that uh, uh, as well as a as a very big challenge. Yeah, I think I see two items in the market that are that are uh, big big issues with shadow AI. And the first one is, is shadow AI typically is done by people who are more technical, while the corporate IT environment or organization is I wouldn't say they're less technical. I think they are more focused on the traditional type of hardware. Right. So in other words. A, a traditional IT organization might be more familiar with CPUs than with GPUs, right? So what's a GPU and how, yeah. how do I use it? And, and, and why does one GPU cost so much more than, than, another, than a CPU, for example? And I think the second piece is the methodology. It's, it's the, the corporate IT organization understanding that DevOps is, is, is the way to go. And I think the challenge there is is DevOps is a little bit like rock the boat all the time, but rock it a little bit, while I feel corporate IT is more like don't rock the boat at all. How do you how do you see in the market, you know, those 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 kind of confront well, I wouldn't say confrontations, but different approaches between corporate IT and and the shadow AI organizations. Yeah. Um I, I totally agree with what you're saying, right? Uh, the GPUs is a new creature in the data science, in the data center, right? Uh, for IT, so there, there's a lot of challenges and questions on how to, how to, you know, manage GPUs, how to, to build the infrastructure around GPUs, uh, and then it, it comes with DevOps and, and and so on, and there is conflict, right? So I think. The AI teams, the data science teams, they, they understand that the benefits that could be for centralized infrastructure, for a lot of compute and that can be offered to them, right? If they could 
get that compute and easy access to that compute, if they could get good services and good tools to consume those that infrastructure, that would be amazing for them. They could be more productive, right? They don't want to deal with infrastructure hassles. They don't want to deal with compute, right? They, they just, they want to run their workloads, train models, experiment with data, right? Do what they do, but they don't want to deal with infrastructure. So if someone can provide it to them, if IT can come in and be like the hero that provides a cloud-like experience, uh, provide services, provide easy access to compute resources for the data scientists, for the AI engineers, that could be awesome, right? And um, so I think that the, the conflicts are, are there, right? So it's, it's very clear what the data scientists and the AI engineers want, right? They, they want easy, right? easy life, good life, right? In terms of when they work with the infrastructure and, and the IT needs to provide it, right? And, um, and, and, and if, and, and I think, that that can be done, right? That can be done. The IT enterprise can be the heroes, and uh, and and the data scientists, the AI engineers can can get what they need. I think that that's a really important point that you're making there, Renan, because from my experience in enterprise IT, uh, the only way to get control of shadow IT is to offer a better and more compelling solution. You can't just go in there and say, you're not supposed to have your own stuff, so I'm going to take it. I mean, you know, you go into your kid's room and you say, oh, you know, I didn't buy you this toy. I'm going to take it. Well, that's not going to lead to a good solution. Uh, but on, if you can actually lead them to a better solution, if you can say, look, here's the thing. If each of you in, in, in application groups buys one, you know, medium-sized, you know, uh, system, then we're going to have 10 of these things throughout the business. But for the same money, we could buy a mega size system, share it with you, and you can get your work done in a tenth as much time because you're sharing these resources. It becomes more compelling, especially if you can offer it as a service as a, in a more flexible way to say, look, not only that, but we're not going to make you like come to a meeting and schedule things. We're going to make sure that you know you can access it when you need to. You can you know you can have the the resources you need. You can get more done, but that's only possible if we share these resources because you know it really goes hand in hand. A utilization of 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 resources and um, and and shadow IT. I mean, they're they're really two sides of the same coin, right? Yeah, I have, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, and I think IT has has learned that over the the the, the past, let's say the past decades. It's not the uh, how do I say it the uh, the B O F H. I think that's the uh, it's not that time anymore. They they understand they need to deliver value. Um, they understand, and and I think cloud was a big enabler there. That things like on demand, like pay per use, like self service are are is important right now because that enables their users to be happy, to do better, to do their job in a better way, in a more efficient way. Um, and I think that's what IT is looking for. It's, it is that cloud-like experience. I think that's, that's what you mentioned, Stephen, and that's exactly what they, what they, they need to deliver. And yes, um, I think uh, GPU is a, a different beast, um, but I think with all the lessons learned from how they, uh, how the IT departments dove into cloud, how they delivered that as a service to their organization, the, the, the whole DevOps movement. I think IT now knows how they want to deliver it and how they need to deliver it. Um, there, there just needs to be the right, um, let's say building blocks to ensure that they can deliver that. Yeah, so you both talked about public clouds. How do you see consumption of AI coming from shadow AI, do you see that on premises in, an, in their own data center? Or do you see shadow AI kind of converting more to a consumption model where you really don't know how much capacity you're going to need and you're really not in the, in, in the mood to, to spend a lot of money on GPUs ahead of time? Do, do you see like a split between on premises and public cloud or how do you, how do you see that? Yeah. That that's a great question. I I I don't I don't see a, a split. I think I think this similar situation also appears in the cloud, 
right? We, 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 we spoke with a company that they have a lot of data science activities, a lot of AI activity, and they have both an on-premise uh, infrastructure and a cloud uh, infrastructure. And they spend $10 million a month on, on AI, right? Just on AI for and data science. And the, you know, with speaking with the IT and they don't really know why they're spending $10 million a month on that. And, and you know, and I'm sure if they will look at the utilization of all the cloud machines, they will get the same problem, right? They spend a lot and the utilization is, is, is around 10%, 20% when it comes to GPUs, right? So, so it's very similar also in the cloud. You, you get AI teams, data science teams that are just going to the cloud, spinning up a, a few machines or a cluster and just running their workloads. And typically they don't have the right tools to, to run their workloads. Uh, or, you know, in an efficient way, to use the cloud in an efficient way. Many times to just, you know, spin up a Jupyter notebook on, on a machine and just, you know, uh, and build models or debug the models in, in a very inefficient way like that. And um, so I think it's very similar also in the cloud. Teams are just using shadow AI, shadow, shadow infrastructure, and, and, uh, and really in an inefficient way. Yeah, so you're saying it's basically collect your metrics, you know, know what you're doing and then tune, tune your efficiency and, and cost control and all that. So, so do you see customers focusing on, on one particular item? And maybe another word, another way to say this is do people understand that they, they have to collect metrics as opposed to just let it run and hope, hope everything will run efficiently? Yeah monitoring is a, we spoke about challenges, so monitoring is a big challenge. Uh, typically, organizations don't even know what the, util the utilization of the cluster, right? They don't even know that the utilization is so low. So I think it, it's, it's, it starts with monitoring, it starts with just getting visibility into the infrastructure, getting visibility into the utilization, to the usage patterns, to who's running more, who's using less, who's using more efficiently, who's using uh, less efficiently. So things like that. So visibility is really the first step. Um, and I think then is, is, is understanding the problems, understanding the, inef the, 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 the inefficiency, the challenges around, you know, around getting access to that compute power in an efficient way and, and you know, starting to solve that, those problems. Um, from our work with the organizations, we see it, we see it time after time, right? We're getting in and we, we're getting visibility into the infrastructure. We see the low utilization and then we see the problems and, and then we, we, we solve them, you know, one step after the other. Yeah, another challenge with, with shadow AI is, is typically it's, it's, uh, it's put together by a small team and in some cases one individual and so where the ability to reproduce and regenerate uh, a model consistently and, and even, even going to production, you know, it, it's, it's not an easy task. Where, where do you think the, um, the tool should come to go from shadow AI to creating this ability to reproduce consistently, the ability to validate that your data is coming from an ethical background. Uh, and how about scalability and, and time to market, right? Another thing with, with shadow AI is it's not, typically it's not built for performance, right? It just gets the job done, but how do you tune, right? So it, there's a lot of challenges there and, and uh, it, it, I, I cannot imagine how difficult it is to have a conversation with a customer that, that has something that works, but is far from, from being production you hit the, the nail on the head. It's, I think that's also the reason why a, I mean, a number of, or the number of organizations that actually don't get their AI models into production is enormous. I think most organizations don't get their AI models to production. And I think part of that is because it's developed on shadow AI 
and then there's 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 no plan there's a, there are no resources to actually take those models and put them in production the the easiest the easiest thing to do is buy a gpu workstation put it there start developing your model training it and that but but then right how do i take this into production so uh, organizations that understand that understand that they need that that multi layer approach. One, yes, they need to buy the resources. They need to buy those GPUs. But that's actually that's the easiest thing. You you call Nvidia. You say I, I need a bunch of GPUs. Um, wrap them in a nice DGX and um, put them in my data center. Right. That's 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 easy to do. But then you need to efficiently use those um, resources. One challenge there, which Ronan actually mentioned, is the monitoring, right? Then we need to get insights into how they're being used. But to be able to really provide insights and to really understand what you need to do with that, there's there's another layer on top of that that you need to know about or at least understand. And that's the what are the types of workloads that are running on my uh, uh, on my my um, uh, resources on my platform? Is it a data scientist that's developing? Is it um, training a model? Is it running inference, right? Is it running in production? All these different types of workloads have different resource requirements. Um, and you need to ensure that your system is built for all of those. And you need to understand the different challenges with those different workloads. And I think if an organization wants to successfully put a model into production, they need to understand every phase of it and every challenge that comes with that phase. Um, and they need an efficient way to do that, whether that's one, deliver an interactive development environment with a Jupyter Notebook for their uh, data scientists that are developing the models. They need to have the right resources for them to train those um, models, hopefully in like a, in a set and forget way. Like I need to train my model, do it and come back to me as soon as it's done. And then they need an efficient way to put it into production, whether that's in the cloud or on, 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 on premises or wh wherever on the edge, wherever they want to uh, apply that AI model. Um, and I think that's, that's why most organizations that run shadow AI or have shadow AI or have this shadow AI challenge don't get to that production phase um, because they, they're, they're steps behind um, um, they, they know how to develop it. They know how to train it. It's probably slow because they, it doesn't scale and then they'll never get to production. So do you think that shadow AI is a necessary evil or, or do you think it, it can be avoided for organizations that want to, to play in the AI market? I think it's both. <laughs> I, th I think you need an enabler. Uh, it, um, for I think the more traditional, the more I don't want to say legacy, but the more the, the the companies that run traditional IT, they've had many shadow IT issues that eventually evolved into them delivering a service to their end users, so that they didn't need those shadow IT services anymore. And I think that it's 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 part of the process. Um, some organizations need shadow AI to get to that realization of, oh, I need to take this serious. I need to centralize this. I need to manage this. I need to uh, make sure that it's uh, that IT can deliver that as a service. Other organizations that are probably newer, um, that are built around their AI developments, they understand that they need a scalable solution that helps them do all the steps of the AI uh, development phase, right? All the way from, from build to train, to, to inference. So I think when you need shadow AI as an, as an enabler, yes, it's a necessary evil for some organizations and other organizations will understand that they need to do this right from the get-go. Right, I mean, I do think that AI is definitely, you know, trial and error and prototyping. But when people talk to me about shadow AI, it's, it's I kind of, look at it as somebody had a great ID, but it's not really a corporate ID. And you, you really don't know where this is gonna go, right? So somebody might be doing shadow AI and nobody might ever know anything about it, right? So, so, so I agree with you. I mean, it, it's necessary, but I think from an organization standpoint, because it is shadow, it is in the shadow, 
you know, organizations might not know that it's going on, good or bad, right? And and I think that's where where prototyping and 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 maybe using a starter kit, like you said, you know, you buy some some hardware and, and you get going. But I think it's it's I think it's a challenge, right? I mean, it's it's for organizations, it's not easy um, to to kind of go from traditional IT to AI. Uh, and certainly, there's a lot of definitions about AI, but you know. Um, now, either way, I mean, I think shadow AI will always be there. Um, I, I just, I just want to shed more light on it, right? So make yeah. it less, less shadowy, if I can say. It. Bring it out of the shadows, as it were. But it really yeah. does remind me a lot, Frederick, of the discussion that we're having around DevOps as well, because in a way, uh, DevOps is a, a mature answer to shadow IT or shadow infrastructure. It, it is like as I said earlier, how do we give these people a good answer, an answer that they will embrace uh, instead of just saying, no, 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 you're bad. You can't do this without having IT operations and IT infrastructure involved. And I think DevOps was a way to say, look, let's have a conversation. Let's invite these people together and let's give them the power that they need to provision uh, infrastructure to support their ideas in a way that is sensible to the corporation. So in a way, aren't we always, aren't we all just sort of talking about ML ops here? I mean, is this just an ML ops discussion or is there some unusual nuance that I'm missing? That's an amazing point, Stefan. I think, yeah, uh, the shadow AI, I think it starts in the research phase, right? Data scientists that then the, a lot of them are researchers not engineers, right? So many times AI starts in a, with a small as, as a small research, right? A small research project. And, uh, and then, right, with, with researchers, they want to get, you know, do stuff very fast, right? They, if they need compute, then they quickly, they want to get that compute and they want to have the freedom to do what they need uh, for the research, right? To move the research very quickly, right? So if it's that, if it means compute that they buy for themselves, then let it be, right? They have the freedom without compute and that's amazing. They can move really fast with their research, right? And then it becomes a problem, however, when you want to scale the research, right? You have a lot of researchers or when you want to scale the research projects, then if you're doing it in a small scale environment, that becomes a problem, right? So, so I think that's one thing and then the second is what we discussed here is when you move to production, right? You have these uh, research activities in your organization, but at the end you want to take them to production to deploy models and really bring business value. And, and there are a lot of challenges uh, around that, organizational challenges as, as we described here, but also in terms of the infrastructure, right? You, because it, and it comes, and it comes also to MLOs, right? You want to, you need to put processes around production and processes and, 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 you know, best practices and centralized things to get good control of your production environments. And then it comes to, to MLOps and you need to find good ways to move research to production also in terms of, uh, of infrastructure and, and operations. And then MLOps is, is an amazing new, new space that comes in right now. Um, and, 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 and it's great. Yeah, I think MLOps is a methodology that kind of identifies that the market is going much faster than it ever has been going, meaning software releases are, are going much, much faster because it's driven by the open source community. And you could actually go to GitHub and download the latest sources, right? It doesn't have to be a quote unquote official release. And then secondly, the hardware, right? And I think ML, MLOps is kind of addressing the extreme dynamic behavior of this where MLOps gives you a methodology where it says, well, we understand you're working with Python and some other tools and CUDA versions, but in the end, you're not locked down. And that's what different with traditional IT where you, you try to lock as much down as possible because you don't want any variables. And MLOps is basically saying, sure, I realize the world is all about a billion different types of variables. And here is a methodology to, to handle that. And, and I think MLOps is, 
is is very difficult to define in the sense that it's a moving target, right? I mean, it's it's going so fast, but we need those methodologies, and I think that's the only way to get out of shadow AI, or at least to go to production. Maybe that's a better way to say it is is the ML ops methodology and accept that change is 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 guaranteed, right? And you need a methodology to do that. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. So MLOps is really is moving fast and it's really, really, really important when it comes to, to machine learning in production. And, and there are new challenges there, right? You, you mentioned some of them. The fact that machine learning is a statistical algorithm, right? We're not talking anymore about just deterministic code that, you know, that I'm pro programming, I'm programming a deterministic algorithm and then I run it as a web application. It's a, it's a model, a statistical model that I, I as a data scientist, as an engineer, I trained on a sample or a set of samples, a set of data with some distribution. So that's, a, it has statistical nature. When I run that model in production, I'll get good predictions or, or good results with a certain accuracy, with a certain probability, right? So how do you manage that in production? How do you monitor that in production? How do you put up processes around something with statistical nature, right? That's a new thing. And then the MLOps is, is emerging right now and it's, it's totally important and it's so totally exciting to see what's going on there. A lot of exciting stuff happening there. So to summarize the conversation, um, you know, now that we've kind of reached the end of the discussion here, um, what is your prescription? What, what should the listeners be thinking of? I mean, so if we've got IT people listening, what should they be thinking of? And if we have, uh, I guess, ML and data science people, you know, what's the, what's the quick hit that they should take away? Yeah, um, I think, right, we, we spoke about shadow AI, so the importance of, of centralizing the infrastructure and, and creating that infrastructure stack that could provide the best um, efficiency for the data scientists. So providing simple access to compute power, providing tools and services um, to the data scientists is so, so important for the IT, for the centralized infrastructure to be successful. I think if, if that happens, then data scientists are becoming more productive. They can run more jobs, train more models, be much more, much more productive. So if data scientists and IT can go together and, and you know, create that in AI infrastructure and create what they need to, to develop AI and change the world with AI, that could be really something amazing. Well, thank you so much for that. And um, thank you for this great discussion. As I said, this does have so much uh, resonance to me. It reminds me so much of what we heard from uh, back in the days of, of various aspects of IT operations and IT infrastructure. So it, it, it's definitely uh, another, another face of a, of a familiar question. So uh, now comes the time in the podcast when we uh, ask you three questions. Uh, this is a tradition we started last season and we're continuing it now. Uh, as a note to our listeners, our guests have not been prepared for this or prepped or told what the questions are. This is a surprise for them so that we can get some off the cuff answers and see their personality a little. Uh, we're also changing things up this season by introducing a question from a previous podcast guest uh, for our, our, our uh, guests here today. Uh, I'll ask a question as will Frederick, and then the third question comes from our previous guest. So Frederick, I'll let you go first, and you can address it to either of them, uh, wh whoever you think is most appropriate. Uh, let's go with uh, Gasbert, and the question is, is it possible to create a truly unbiased AI? Ooh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a very interesting one. I think that the chat and then we've seen it we've seen it multiple times that it's hard to really uh build unbiased ai because i think the the reason um it's all about data it's all about the the data you feed into the model um and um, um if if that data for some reason not i don't i don't think it the data will be biased by nature it's it's not biased because it's built biased i think it's it, it it's 
it's it's the data that feeds into the system. C can it be truly unbiased? I don't know if the data is truly unbiased, unbiased, truly balanced, then I think we can eventually, but um, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for, for every single AI model out there. And we've seen it unfortunately happen multiple occasions that even though the goal was to build an unbiased model to make something unbiased, the results were biased. Um, and again, there, there's, there's no one, there's no developer to blame there. The only thing you can blame there is the data. Um, and I think, so where does unbiased AI start? It starts with the data. Thank you. I think that that's a, a more nuanced answer than maybe, um, you know, the average person might, might, might hear, but it, I think it's true. And I think it lines up with what we've heard from some of our, our other guests as well. Um, so Ronan, I'll throw this one to you since we were just talking about MLOps. I want to know, is MLOps a lasting trend or is this just another step on the way for machine learning and the ML infrastructure and DevOps and everything just to be normal IT? Got it. Um, I think MLOps is amazing, right? It's, it's, uh, it's really needed, right? That there, there is room for MLOps. Right for definitions on how to manage and and and, and deploy a machine learning in production. Right, the DevOps world did wonderful things for the technology world. Right, so MLOps brings amazing stuff. And in the long term, let's see and let's see and wait. I I, I have big hopes for machine learning ops, but let's see. And our final question uh, comes from a previous guest. Uh, this question is brought to us by uh, Tony Pikeaday, a Senior Director of AI Systems at NVIDIA. Tony, take it away. Hi, I'm Tony Pikeaday, Senior Director of AI Systems at NVIDIA. And this is my question. Can AI ever teach us how to be more human? I really have to think about that one. That's, uh, that I... It's more of a philosophical question, right? It's uh, it is how can a human be more human, right? It's uh, it's uh, that, that that's that's to me impossible. Um, the other way around, can we teach AI to be more human? I think that's that's actually more possible than making humans more humans. I think that the beauty of humans is that. They're, they are so unpredictable and they are they 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 are conscious of themselves and there's so many there's so many things that um, um, def well not, not necessarily defines but what makes up a human it's, I, I don't think AI can make us more human yeah yeah I, I totally agree I think AI for sure will cause us will change the way we act as humans, right? So we as humans are, are totally different than uh, like what humans been thousands of years ago, right? Um, and so with AI, for sure, it's going to change so much, so many things that also us as human beings will, will change. Well, thank you very much for those thoughtful answers. And uh, thank you for joining us today for this discussion of uh, shadow AI and utilization. Uh, we look forward to hearing what your question might be for a future guest. And if our listeners want to get in on the fun, you can just send an email to host at utilizing-ai.com and we'll record your question for a future guest. So um, Heis and Ronen, um, where can people connect with you and follow your thoughts on enterprise AI and other topics? Yeah, best way to find me is on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm reachable there, so happy to, to connect there. And same for me, I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn, I'm active on Twitter. Um, I think if you want to know a little bit more about both me and Ronen, and I, I, I know it's, it's a couple of months away, but uh, GTC um, in March will be a big event for, for Run AI as well with many sessions. So you'll be able to see us there um, and, and listen to our thoughts on, uh, on, on how to build AI infrastructure that's ready for the future. Yeah, I know that we're both looking forward to GTC as well. So uh, probably everybody in the audience is going to be paying attention to that. So you can find uh, 
find all of us uh, involved there in one way or another. Well, thank you very much for listening to uh, the Utilizing AI podcast. Uh, if you did enjoy this discussion, please do subscribe in your favorite podcast application and give us a rating and review while you're there. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by gestaltit.com, your home for IT coverage from across the enterprise. For show notes and more episodes, go to utilizing-ai.com, or you can connect with us on Twitter at utilizing underscore AI. This is our last podcast of the year 2021. Uh, we're going to take next week off uh, to spend some time relaxing with our friends and family here at the end of the new year and into the new year. Um, and we want to thank our listeners for listening to us and making 2021 such a great year for us. We'll be back with more Utilizing AI on January 4th, 2022. So we'll see you then. <laughs>